thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Charlie and I do these advocacy trainings every year, but you know, obviously in person and we do them regionally throughout Massachusetts and we get to see you guys in person and you know, obviously it's, it's a lot more effective and easier to answer your questions. And um, Charlie and I get to stop at Dunkin' Donuts on the way there <laughs> and on the way back. <laughs> we're both like we're both coffee drinkers that don't right. care what time of day it is we can Morning get it at eight o'clock at night <laughs> <laughs> so um but you know we're certainly saving on gas that's for sure yeah. um but yeah we do miss it and happy saint patrick's day to everybody sure. i'm here with charlie fisk and ellen ryan taverna so you're getting a uh, the irish team <laughs> <laughs> at the arc just for today <clears throat> but um all right well i know we probably will have people joining us as we go but we really have so much to cover today and as i was looking through um my slides you know i feel like i could talk and talk on each slide so i'm going to try to keep myself moving along so we don't go over um and again i just want to thank you for being here advocacy right now has never been more critical and some of you on this call have been uh, amazing advocates over the years. I recognize your faces, I know you well. Um, and so some of this may be a bit of review. Um, and so, but hopefully, you know, you will, you will find some um, nuggets that you can hang on to. And um, I think sometimes it's good to just review the process in general. And there's been a lot of changes. Um, just since the last time Charlie and I did this was in October, and we still brought in a whole lot of issues around COVID um, to address, but we've had changes in the state house, we've had changes in our advocacy, we have a new budget, we have a new legislative platform. So there's a whole lot going on, but um, I think I will start with just sharing my screen so we can all get on the same page. And let's see if I can do it without delay, like many times before. Resume, I don't want to resume, I want to start. Slow. There we go. All righty. Okay, so just in case you don't know myself or Charlie, my name is Maura Sullivan. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the ARC of Massachusetts, and I'm also the Director of Operation House Call, which is our, our medical and graduate nursing student training program. And I've been extremely lucky to be part of the ARC family for about seven or eight years now and teaching for Operation House Call even longer. So um, lots of gratitude for having a job that feels um, like family and feels like a per personally so meaningful every day. I have three kids and my two boys are teenagers with autism. Mm -hmm. um, but one of them, I say it that, that way because in just a couple of weeks, my um, middle son will turn 20, which I can't believe. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so we are, we are living this every day, um, my family. Um, so I, you know, I know for a lot of the family members out there, I understand a lot about what you're going through. And um, I'm just gonna let Charlie introduce himself and then we'll get, we'll get jumping into our slides. Thank you, Maura. I'm Charlie Fisk. I've been with the ARC probably about four months longer than Maura. Um, and prior to that, I was in Africa with the Peace Corps. And before that, a long history of, of human service involvement, both with mental health, Department of Youth Services, developmental disabilities, and, and most recently now have come back in a different kind of way um, because of a injury my daughter has with an acquired brain injury, um, a very severe one. So all of a sudden I'm looking at the arc and advocacy from a personal point of view, which is, is giving much more insight to all the things that all of you go through, which I knew about, but from a personal point of view, it's very different. And part of what we do, myself and Mara, um, is try to move the system forward. And it's just kind of sometimes an uphill battle. But I think one of the strongest things we have is our personal commitment to advocacy. Because without that advocacy, things don't change. Uh, and we've seen it over the years with the legislation. And we also see it in our own family. So we salute all of you to be advocates. And it means never stopping and just keep moving forward. And thank you for having us here today. Thank you. you want to, go ahead, Mark. 
you want to okay. thanks charlie all right so uh we do have a lot to get accomplished today just put up the goals um giving giving people a little bit of background on the arc and and um you know this time a little bit more on the arc of the united states because uh we have found just an incredible uh, importance around the relationship with the ARC US right now. So I'll give you a little update on what's happening with them and how to stay connected to them. Um, we'll do a dis we'll do an update on COVID and um, talk about our budget advocacy um, for FY22, which some of you may have heard or seen our fact sheets, but we're going to also talk about the best ways to advocate more than just following our take action um, action alerts and sending um, the template letters, but going going a step further. Um, and Charlie, we'll talk a, a bit about the legislative process and some of the leadership changes that have occurred um, at the beginning of this uh, 192nd session. And, and then we'll, we'll finish with a little more around tips for solidifying your relationships um, with your legislators. And, you know, I put this photo up because <laughs> this is kind of how we are doing advocacy now. This was uh, taken, I think, during our supporting family um, event, which um, actually had quite a few technological <laughs> difficulties. So we're still <clears throat> really working our way around some of this new way to advocate. There are some benefits to it in terms of access for people who normally wouldn't get to, um, you know, to, to be involved in some of these events or to testify at hearings. Um, but I have to say nothing really beats um, being together like we were last year at our uh, legislative reception just really a year or so ago when we crammed this room with uh, over 500 people. And um, I'll tell you, if you're if you're a rep or a senator or a leadership at the state house, and you walk by and you see this room filled like this for a disability advocacy day, um, you're going to pay attention. So, given that, we really do have our work cut out for us to continue to make um, our our voice heard and our presence known on Beacon Hill, and that really comes down to your relationships with your legislators individually since these type of big events are probably not gonna happen, maybe not to this extent, again, um, having to really take a new look at the way we do our events uh, next year even. So um, that said, <clears throat> advocacy has also been very different this year. We have This is like an advocacy uh, word cloud that we put together and um, it doesn't even begin to uh, describe all of the areas that we have worked on in terms of advocacy or even address what individuals and families have been going through. Um, but when I look at this, uh, this past year has been all about health equity and vaccine prioritization and uh, trying to support families better and negotiating rates for providers and sending letters for hazard pay. And <clears throat> you guys have accomplished so much. <laughs> um, and we've really had a lot of success through that advocacy. Um, we have a lot more to do, so that's why we're here today. And um, everybody knows I can't really do a presentation without including my kiddos. So this is their one, their one picture. Um, you know, still my, still my older son won't really wear his mask uh, consistently, <clears throat> but my younger guys still doing a good job. But what, I put this uh, slide up about the mission of the Ark. Because um, when I read it now, it feels uh, it feels really challenging, um, especially when I look at you know we advocate for community services and supports that foster social inclusion, self determination, and equity across all aspects of society. Well, that that line in itself has been one of the greatest challenges um, this year. I mean, for real good reasons, um, you know, social inclusion is kind of off the table at this moment and finding creative ways around that um, has been has been really tough on families and on programs um, and individuals. But equity has really risen to the surface as one of our main issues to focus on health equity, equity in pay. Um, equities for families and 
So more than ever, our mission continues to be incredibly important. So stick with us. And for those of you who don't know kind of all the areas that the ARC focuses on, um, these are them. And I would, you know, blow up the budget right now as our, as our big area and legislation as we just kicked off our new platform for the new legislative session. Um, this year, because of COVID, we've had a lot of focus on policy and even working on a federal level on policy and Medicaid together. Um, still, our programs and our trainings uh, are so important. We've been doing webinars weekly. Um, some points we had three a week going on and um, you can still find them weekly with Leo and often with Carrie and then once a month with Ellen and I. Um, and we're still running our programs. Operation House Call is still going strong, um, pivoting to virtual and keeping everybody as safe as possible. So um, what's, what's on everybody's mind is, is the vaccine issue. And um, our, our advocacy, you know, if you follow the ARC, has been very focused on trying to prioritize all individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their caregivers. Um, I did hear today that the governor uh, was making an announcement and you know, if anybody heard him already, let me know. But I guess he was um, you know, putting out the prioritization for the rest of the phases. So for the rest of the residents of Massachusetts, so um, for, for us, I think that means that we may need to change our strategy in terms of how do we um, bump up people with disabilities so that we're not getting our vaccines in July um, so that we can begin to get back into, um, into our day programs and safely into our schools. Um, and so that caregivers can safely go back to work um, and people can just end this isolation. So uh, today we, I had a meeting actually with um, the chair of the uh, vaccine uh, committee for at the, at the legislature, which um, they are doing some hearings continuously. So people are still working on this equity issue of vaccines. So our voices are still super important. And uh, we're considering thinking about, you know, trying to get Massachusetts to change the comorbidity list so that um, and right now it, it includes um, Down syndrome, but we're saying, you know, open that up to all IDD and autism. Um, and that may bump us up the list as people with one comorbidity do go before the rest of, of the phase three folks. So that, that might be a, a way we pivot right now um, to try to include more individuals with IDD. However, we still have the issue of, of caregivers and we would love to see at least those people with IDD having companions like those over 65. So it's a constant uh, moving target, but you know, stay tuned. We will have uh, letters and we will have advocacy prepared around this topic. Um, and anywhere you can reach out, do so, whether it's um, if you have media contacts or if you can write letters to the editor, um, definitely contact your legislature. They've heard from us at almost 3,000 letters now. Um, and I'm hearing from them saying, you know, we're, we're getting these letters in. Thank you. Um, we're bringing it to our leadership. And uh, that's what we need to hear. So continued advocacy focuses around equity in healthcare. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about our top priority bill, which is a hospital training bill, which you, if you follow the ARC, you may have seen it in years past. This year, it's never been more important. Um, not only do we need to make sure healthcare uh, professionals and, and clinicians um, know how to care for people with IDD and autism in a hospital setting, we really have to make sure that they're following the guidance around accommodations. We heard from way too many families this year that they were scared to bring a loved one to the hospital for fear of being separated from them during care. We heard from way too many families who were separated from their loved one. Um, and we need to make sure that all hospitals understand that um, they, uh, people with disabilities are able to have support people throughout their care in the hospital, regardless of COVID. <clears throat> um, 
So we're also looking to uh, have more assistance for individuals and families at home. And we'll talk a little bit more about our families and individuals first campaign that we'd love to have everybody get behind. The workforce crisis continues to be a huge priority. And as a matter of fact, uh, a, uh, even more critical crisis as we emerge from COVID and we um, want to reopen our programs. Um, we need to make sure that that workforce is able to come back and you really the best way to do that is to pay them equitably. Um, but there's more to the workforce campaign than that. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, and then our, our big push to preserve day and residential safety net. That's really all about the budget. And, uh, and addressing special education needs. We do have some good news about the federal package. Um, so we'll talk about that. So it's not all uphill right now. We have some things that are gonna help us along the way. Um, so in terms of vaccines, I mean, I think people probably are up to speed on this. Uh, so we won't spend too much time here. Um, just some of the advocacy that has been done already and the, some things that we still need to work on is vaccine hesitancy in our workforce. So working on um, helping folks that take care of individuals with IDD to have um, an informed decision making process and to feel comfortable and have that vaccine when they're ready um, and make you know everyone's world safer that way. Uh, we're looking to DDS to update visitation guidance now that there is new vaccine data to analyze and say, you know, how can we ease these restrictions on families and individuals that have been so tough um, since last March or um, some folks really have had increased restrictions since November. Uh, and it's all kind of all over the place. So certain providers are certainly opening up and making things easier and others um, Others are still sticking to the guidance from November. So we wanna see that start to move forward for families and reunification um, and you know, to start to address some of the emotional pain that families have felt from separation. So to look, take a look at our 2022 recovery and maintenance ask. Now, remember, uh, you guys don't, nobody has to understand the numbers, the line items really behind this, um, but it's just good for, for everyone to see what we're really looking for from these line items this year. And our line items are much more vast and broad than just these three that you see in front of you. The other DDS line items, um, we are looking to maintain um, the governor's house one um, uh, allocation. Um, these three line items, we are looking for substantial increases. So um, family support, $7 million more, uh, day and work programs, $15 million and transportation, $7 million as well. So let's just go a little bit into what we really need out of these uh, line items and why we're asking for, for this money. So families, as you, you know, have basically spent the last year without their lifeline supports in place in their communities and in their homes. Uh, caregivers are doing it all 24 seven, managing challenging behaviors, personal care, nursing tasks. Um, they've shifted to support virtual learning and most are doing that while juggling uh, their own uh, work and all of their other family responsibilities. We're looking to say that 3 million of this 7 million that we get in should go directly to families who have been homebound um, without all the strings attached in terms of, you know, you have to use it for this specific um, type of service. Uh, we want to see families um, be supported through this line item the way they need to be supported with flexibility and um, an opportunity because uh, at this point in time, it's been very difficult to find even um, help to come into the home. So if they were getting family support, but were unable to use it, it certainly isn't because they're hanging out doing fine. It's because they just can't get anyone to come in or, you know, it's just not safe enough. So we're hoping to see um, the substantial support around families. Um, 
And then we want to look beyond the budget line item for families. And we want to look to what other things can we do to support families going forward. And some of that is going to be legislation related. So we will um, be sharing with you a bunch of bills that really support families and want you to get behind those that matter to you. Um, and we're also going to be working on more of the federal level um, with some of the new initiatives coming out uh, around family caregiving and paid caregiving. Um, so lots, lots on that. It's very exciting. We're really happy to be jumping in kind of full force on this family support campaign um, and technology initiatives, which really will affect uh, families, families who are unable to have the um, appropriate technology in their home and those who, who need um, more supports. So um, that's families. And so our day programs are a, a huge concern right now. The budget that came out from the governor, um, you know, didn't really anticipate enough around the return to community-based services and the work opportunities after people are vaccinated. Um, it was really looking at, you know, utilization from, uh, from last year's budget. And obviously it was way, way down. Um, as so many day programs were uh, closed for periods of time. Some are still temporarily closed. Some are closed their, their doors all the way. Um, and many uh, merged together with other programs to just hang on. So, uh, so we're really in a crisis for day programs. Um, the, the system Mass Health is looking at um, a way to create day programming that is more flexible and will meet the needs of individuals and families, things that we've learned over this uh, COVID timeframe um, that work for families, uh, things that they don't wanna go back to that they may have had in day programming before. So this whole redesign is incredibly important um, for how we move forward post COVID and uh, hearing from the individuals, the families, and the providers to make this happen is gonna be critical. So there are focus groups and work groups going on, um, but we need to keep pushing this inside because this is um, <coughs> something that will really change, basically change the world of people who attend day, day programs and day services. Um, and for current though, you know, with restrictions being lifted across the state around, you know, numbers of people that can go to um, restaurants and, and be in certain spaces, uh, we need to see what they can do for day programs so people can um, begin to go back. Many of these programs are space limited, so they could, their hands are tied around letting, letting people back in until this guidance is shifted. Um, so hoping to see that happening soon for those day programs. Um, so many of the folks, how it affects families at home um, many have been home, completely homebound, maybe doing some virtual since March. And although this is really should have been considered a congregate setting, it was not prioritized for the vaccine. Um, and, you know, we've heard from a lot of families that say, wow, you know, what a huge disincentive this is. You know, I, I'm keeping my son or daughter home um, from a residential placement, which would cost the state, you know, Millions. hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, yet there's very little incentive um, in terms of the supports that come our way as a family. And um, just so everyone knows, there was some enhanced uh, billing, enhanced uh, funding for these programs just to keep them hanging on, even though I even mentioned the ones that were closed or temporarily closed. Um, but in June, that funding ends. And at this point, we are unsure of what they're going to be able to do um, for these day programs. Hopefully, the federal package that just passed is going to be helpful. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But last piece on the increases for the budget is transportation. And obviously, none of these uh, day programs um, or any kind of work opportunities will be successful without transportation. Uh, families must be able to go back to work. Families must be able to, um, to live their lives without having to, you know, transport um, the, their loved by themselves. 
So uh, we're looking for $7 million in this line item. Right now, a, a van that serves uh, 12, that can fit 12 people, is really only able to have two. So you can imagine what that means for, um, for managing uh, transportation in these programs. So again, the sooner we can get people vaccinated, have these uh, the guidance changed and the restrictions lifted. Um, these programs will have real opportunity. So, so you, so there's easy ways to advocate for these line items, and probably you've already done it, but um, you may not have. And our budget um, letter that will go out to your legislator automatically if you click on our take action or the link that you'll find throughout our social media and on the website. Um, it will automatically send a letter and it literally takes less than a minute. Um, and right now I think we're, we're kind of slow on the budget letters. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we're still under 500. So we really wanna see that increase so that it gets in front of as many legislators as possible. They are currently meeting with leadership about their priorities. And the more they hear from their constituents um, through these letters, they're more likely going to bump up our issues as priority. So these letters are super helpful. If you're not part of our, our uh, mailing list right on this page, if you scroll down, you'll see where you can enter your name and, and be part of our mailing list and join um, and get notified every time there's, there's something going on. You can also find your legislators um, both your congressional representatives and your local leaders here on this page when you put your address in. So check that out, get familiar with this website if you're not, but I'll tell you, even more impactful is your words, your personal stories, your statements, your comments that you can make directly outside of those letters or you can actually um, you know, uh, customize those letters as well. But these are just little blurbs that I have gotten in from families um, and they're so powerful and they really make an impact on legislators. Um, you don't have to write out six pages of what's been going on. You don't have to uh, give tons of data um, about your program, or, um, but you, you do need to make your point. And so just, you know, reading through some of these, um, my sons are regressing without intensive behavioral interventions. They need and are unable to follow protocols wearing masks due to sensory uh, and behavioral challenges. Um, you know, just for legislators to hear these challenges, um, as a caregiver, I don't know what I, would happen happened to me um, when my two boys, if my son and I were to get ill, we have no backup system. You know, I think um, without hearing these things, people make a lot of assumptions. Um, I like this one. I'm a teacher, but I'm a nurse. I'm going to try to volunteer to give vaccines out in an attempt to get a, an option for my 33-year-old son with autism. He can't stay in lockdown any longer. Um, this one's from a mom who uh, was diagnosed with COVID-19 and the flu. And she had three kids and one with autism. And she said, you know, three weeks of no service because of quarantine. I cried. He sad all day. I'm not a complainer and I don't ask for help. But in these past 10 days have been so rough, heartbreaking and 14 more days inside. So um, these are the type of snippets that you can send and, and tell your story and, and make a huge difference. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, uh, I see him backsliding even from FaceTime. Oh, so powerful. So consider just um, reaching out personally. Okay, so this slide cracks me up because we always used to start um, our advocacy trainings with this. And you know, it's still very true. This is uh, the definition of advocacy and it's important. And all of these things really matter um, in terms of affecting your, your uh, affecting change. But what we really know is this is advocacy. Uh, this is what we've learned. It's dogged determination. Sadly, it's crisis, it's tragedy. It can be celebrity. Um, we know it's grassroots in numbers. We've seen it work over and over that way. Uh, sometimes it's legislative leverage. You get lucky, you have a legislator who has a clear path 
Um, an example of that is you know, a, a simple a piece of legislation that um, one of our champions took under his belt uh, around, it's called PANDAS, PANS, and some of you may be familiar with the medical condition. Uh, he just ran with that and he got the speaker on board and during a really challenging year, he was able to pass that legislation with the help of many incredible families. Um, so that kind of leverage he used uh, personally to be a champion for that group uh, worked. Um, coalitions, so important. The, when we have coalitions, we have more data, we have more people involved, um, we have more points of view, and uh, it's much more powerful. And we all know that the media, especially social media these days, is really a huge tool. Um, you can tag your legislator in any, tag them in, in a, description of what's going on in your family or what you need. Um, it's a public way for them to respond, for them to see um, what the real issues are. They may get comments um, in support and uh, it's really worth it. If you're not on social media, it's worth it to get on it just, just to connect with your legislators. And um, I would recommend Twitter because you can tag them and they'll see it no matter what on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, and media still matters. So getting those, um, you know, TV clips and articles in in the Globe, uh, Herald, everywhere. So local paper. Um, and then of course there's legal action, which so many of you know we've had to go to in the past, and it is an effective way uh, to create change. Um, okay, so jumping back to some good news. Um, so I think some of you saw that we got our federal relief package passed and I think they call it the American Rescue Plan. And this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one that Charlie and Ellen and I have been uh, updating you on. And each and every time a federal relief package came out, uh, the the provisions that we, we were hoping for were not in those packages previously. But this one had those provisions. So we're really, really thrilled. Um, it was really hard fought advocacy and probably many of you uh, connected with the ARC of the United States to send letters and maybe connected with your Congress people around it. But what this does is it really um, boosts our home and community based services um, through a, a, what they call an F map, which is a federal mapping. And it's at 10% increase from this March until next April. And that's a significant boost for our programs um, that are waiver-based in community services, which are a multitude of services and programs here in Massachusetts. Um, it also included uh, stimulus for adult dependents, monies for education and early education, and many, many other provisions that will be extremely useful to, to people with disabilities. And I know Ellen's on here. If she wants to add anything, just unmute. Um, we also have um, a new bill. And also, if you, you know, want to add anything about that, Ellen, we're super excited about. It's, um, it's called the Home and Community-Based Services Access Act. And I wanted to bring it up because if you haven't recently been involved with advocating uh, with your representative or senator on a national level, this is a great opportunity to reach out and connect with them. Uh, this bill needs their support. They, our Massachusetts delegation is, is, none of them are sponsors of this bill, um, which is okay, but we do need them to get behind it 100%. Um, this bill will really uh, allow us more access, less waiting time, more funding, and more expanded services um, for people who may have initially had to be in more residential, uh, less inclusive settings. And um, so before I go on, anything you want to add on any of that, Ellen? Not to put you on the spot, but. Uh, no, I would just encourage, so we're going to have um, Susanna Savage, who's from Warren's office, on our webinar on April 1st. And um, so I would, you know, Warren is, um, I'm, I'm assuming will be a co-sponsor of this, but, you know, it'd be great to get her take on it. 
Um, and she's going to go into detail um, of what's in the American Rescue Plan as well. But I think you covered yeah. it, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be talking about it more. I know that's something that um, yeah. the ARC of U.S. has prioritized. Awesome. I'm so excited to have her on. That will be, that will be great. Um, so the, so, you know, I've stick these up there just in case you don't know who your, uh, congressional leader is. And there was one change there. Um, you can also follow this bill by following the ARC, um, US, oops, yeah, the ARC.org. Um, and they will, they will definitely be, this is the work that they've been doing for decades, um, coming to fruition in a bill. So very, very exciting. And I think I will turn it over to Mr. Fisk to give you some background on um, on the legislative process and the changes that are going on mm -hmm. at the State House. Thank you, Mara. Just as a follow-up from that last slide, um, yeah. with the representatives we had, every 10 years we have a census. Um, and there's some possibility that one of those members may not be able to be uh, in office because we may lose a congressional seat because of shift in population. And it's, um, so that's on the horizon. And part of that's going to be determined um, once the census is there and taking a look at population. So I just mentioned that as an aside. Um, the, the legislature that we are dealing with, it, there's a number of changes that have taken place. And pre, probably the, the biggest one is the fact that there's a new Speaker of the House. Um, Speaker DeLeo, who had been there a number of terms, um, resigned just uh, at the beginning of this year, and Ron Mariano, who is the minority leader, stepped up to become the new Speaker of the House. Now, the importance of that is that the, the Speaker is the one who basically determines who's going to be running what committees. Um, so that's a huge, big change. And we've had pretty good relationship with Mariano, who is a teacher by background, um, and we look forward to working with him. And on the next slide, if you take a look at the, the state is broken up into 160 legislative seats on the House side and 40 on the Senate side. And each representative has about 42,000 people in his or her district. And the Senate has 160,000. Now, those districts may shift a little bit with the population uh, once determined by the uh, by the, the Census Bureau. And there's a special committee in the legislature that actually will help do that redistricting called a special redistricting committee. A lot of the members will be looking at what's gonna happen with their own districts. And some of those will shift a little bit. They may lose a piece of a town or, or whatever, but that's on the horizon. Um, and if you slide down to the, the next slide, the, we work closely with about five committees uh, in the legislature. And I put up, Mariano's picture and Claire Cronin, who is now the majority leader. Um, she was chair of the Judiciary Committee. She's second in command and that's right behind Mariano. And that's actually a good thing because we've had pretty good dealings with, with both Mariano and also with Claire Cronin. Uh, we wish her well. There's, there's three committees listed there that we do a lot of transaction with. Um, children, families, and persons with disabilities. The leadership in that committee has changed. So not many of the people that were on the committee this past session uh, are still there. So a lot of what we're doing now is reaching out and establishing new relationships with some of these people. Um, healthcare financing is another committee we deal with, um, public health committee. And the other committee that's not listed there, but we do have a lot of dealings with is the educational committee. Um, and some of the bills we've been looking at involve families and educational kinds of needs. Um, again, part of our ag advocacy with the legislature is getting to meet new faces. There were 22 new members of the House uh, and combined in the Senate this year, and we've been reaching out to a lot of them. Um, I've sat down and reached out to all of them personally with little notes. I, I think the COVID is in some ways has forced me to write a little bit more and to reach out personally and get back a number of responses. Now, Normally we would go and hang at the state house and meet all the players, but it doesn't happen that way. So part of the advocacy we're doing is establishing new relationships with some of these people, especially the new ones. Um, so, so Charlie, can I interrupt you just to say, sure. you know, if if you don't know what committees your legislator is on, um, I think it's a really important thing to know. So it's really easy to find out if you um, look them up on masslegislature.gov, and we can provide that link because I don't think it's on um, 
on this, but you know, some of you are already familiar with it. And take a look because they probably have changed committee if you know right. which committee they were on last session. And we had a major shakeup in children and families where we lost uh, Chair Kay Khan, who's been the chair on that committee for many, many years. Um, and, you know, it, we have built long relationships with those folks. So to have a change in some ways is, is more challenging, but it also is an opportunity. Um, so the, your, the two new chairs of children and families, um, if, they're, if you're in their area, certainly reach out to them. Really establish that connection because they're going to be hearing from the ARC and from hopefully all of you um, through their committee chair um, around, you know, I would say at least half of our bills. All right. One of the things that happens with advocacy, there's a tendency for some of us to say, well, I have to talk to the senator or talk to the representative. Sometimes you're better off realizing that it's the staff who sometimes carry the weight. And a lot of the work we did with, say, in the children, families, and persons with disabilities was with the staff. They got to know us. They would return phone calls. Um, they weren't dealing with as many issues as the representative of the senator might have been dealing with. So in many ways, with these two new chairs of those committees, we're going to have new staff to have to deal with and meet uh, and work with. And it's, it's, it's a growing process. And part of it is our advocacy to reach out to them and also to reach out to their chairs. Um, and again, it's the same kind of thing as Mara had mentioned, how important it is for you to take a look at who you're house member is or your senator is and see what committees they're on your ability to do that kind of personal story will have a lot more weight than i will have with that particular member and it makes it easier for that member to say oh i've, I've heard from my constituent who has this particular concern um your ability you're in the best position as an advocate to do that as as mara is a great advocate for her kids um she's able to to get stuff done because she can relate to those members that are her representatives and senators where she lives. Um, the next slide is a little bit about the, the budget process. Um, what happens is in January, the governor releases his budget, uh, usually in the middle of January. And then what happens is that budget gets passed to the House Ways and Means Committee. And as Mara had mentioned right now, the House Ways and Means Committee is listening to individual members that are making appointments with the chair to come in and talk about what their priorities are. And a lot of times the, the chairman of that committee and his staff will say, give us three things that you want to see in your recommendations. They're not going to walk in with 45 or 50 recommendations. It'll be two or three or four. And I had a conversation the other day with a representative who had one of our uh, budget pages and said, I see here what the ARC is doing. That's going to be one of the recommendations that he's going to make to the chairman of the committee. It's that kind of personal advocacy that makes a difference. Once the Senate has, the House has passed the budget, the Senate will take it up again uh, and come up with their own budget. And we'll be into May at that particular point, the end of May. And what will happen is the House and the Senate then will have two separate budgets. They'll have a conference committee, put those budgets together and compromise on what is going to be the budget, and then send that back to the governor by the 1st of July for the governor to sign. And the governor, at that point, he may override or veto and send it back um, to the legislature. And that's down the road a little bit. And, and what will happen sometimes is when the budget is short funded coming into November or December, the governor has the authority by law to go in and say, I'm going to cut out some money that's in the budget simply because the budget has to be balanced. Um, and that's again, that's again, the budget process going forward. Um, yeah. And so Charlie, I would just jump in to remind everybody that um, there's critical time frames to advocate as the budget moves from one house to the next and then into conference committee. So you may see us putting out a lot of stuff over the next three months and it'd be like, oh, I probably already did that. I don't have to do it again. But the, the, the reality is we are targeting one group and then the next group. So we may, right, like right now, we're really looking for the house to take a look at our budget and, and to bring it to leadership and give us these increases. But we gotta start all over again in the Senate and make sure that they uh, also support that. And then if there's any discrepancies, um, we have to make sure that the conference committee picks, you know, the higher number that came out between the two. Between the two. Um, and then often we'll be looking for amendments to, to get us up to where we need to be. So those are all the things you'll be hearing from us. 
Um, here's a letter that's going out to, you know, Senate Ways and Means or going out to conference committee. So just be ready to keep kind of hammering out those letters. Sorry, Tom, you're, you're No, no, that's a great, you, that sounds good. One of the advantages you have, don't forget, all these legislators are looking at a $46 billion budget. Their ability to know every detail in that budget, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages, it's, it's really difficult. Your ability to zero down on a particular line item with a particular number is so critical. So when you go to that representative or senator and say, I'm advocating for this particular line item, it allows them to look that up and say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think part of it is we, as we advocate, there are other groups doing the same kind of thing, transportation people, education people. Um, and so it's a competitive situation, but we know the issues we have are extremely important to all of those members and our ability to translate that. It does come down to that kind of personal issue and your ability to raise that uh, to talk about your son, your daughter, your family member, your family member. It's so, so critical. Um, the, the legislature's in a two-year cycle, every two years. This is the 192nd session. Um, what happens, bills get filed um, in January by everybody, and they're usually about 5,000 bills that get filed. So you can figure that's a fair amount of work. What happens is those bills will be sent to the clerk's office. The clerk will assign them to committees. Now, the legislature itself has 51 committees. There are joint committees in the House and Senate, but each Senate, the Senate has an individual set of committees as well as the House. So you're looking at 51 different committees that those bills will be supported or sent out to. And a lot of the bills we're looking for will end up in children, families uh, with persons with disabilities uh, or healthcare financing or um, education. Um, and that's kind of the, the process. As the bill's going forward, usually, there was a deadline to sign on to a bill. If a member filed a bill, he or she would look around to get co-sponsors. And typically there was a deadline on that, which was two weeks or three weeks after the bill was filed. Now there's going to be a rolling signing on to the bills so that a bill gets into a committee. Any member can still sign on to that bill until it moves out of that committee and moves to the next committee. So the deadline of signing on is kind of open-ended. So if you've got a bill that you're really liking and looking at, Take a look and see if your member has signed on to that. And that's, it's right there on the bill. It'll tell you who signed on to it. And you can go back to that member, say on the House side, say, look, at, I noticed you didn't sign on to this bill that's important. Would you sign on to it? And part of that advocacy is a personal one with you, with your respective member. Hey, um, Charlie, yeah, I would jump in there to say, uh, normally we would have already sent out uh, an action alert asking you to ask your representative and senator to sign on to our entire platform. Um, but because we had a really big push on the vaccine letter, and then we also put out our budget advocacy letter at the same time, and we got this extension on the co-sponsoring of the legislation, um, we held off on that action alert. But you will see that coming up. I think next week is the right time, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll send that out and basically what we'll ask you to do is ask your senator and rep to, to look at our entire platform. But for you, if there's a particular bill, that's where you should flag it and say, you know, I, I, I appreciate the ARCS platform. Or if you don't, you can just narrow down to the bills that you think are important. Um, so, so more to come on that. And just one little small thing. If you take a look at the bills that have already been filed, all 5,000 of them, they're they all have a number and it's listed as like HD 1520. Once those bills get into the committee, that number will change. And what'll happen is the number, uh, it'll become just H something, whatever that particular bill is. So just to be aware of that, um, and, that and that'll take place probably within the next three to four weeks. I think that's it on that end, Mark. All right. Yeah, so in terms of legislation that we were just talking about, I do want to give everybody the heads up. Um, usually we prioritize our, um, our platform, so it's pretty easy to see which bills um, we're going to be really pushing, because when you have 18, 19, 20 bills, um, it's really hard to step into an office, um, you know, to speak with the speaker or the Senate president and say, prioritize all of my bills. Um, so we typically have to narrow it down, although we want all of those bills out there to succeed uh, and move along. Uh, we tend to focus on a few. So it makes it really hard because there are so many important bills. 
that's where you guys can come in advocating for those bills um, individually. And um, this year we are really focused on our healthcare training legislation. Not that we haven't, you know, talked about that each year as a priority, but given what's happened with COVID and, um, and the need that we see even um, across the nation uh, and the work that we're doing on a health equity and healthcare training level um, really comes together with this legislation. So you'll see at the top of our bill platform, we do have a hospital training bill. And um, if you wanna learn more about it, definitely get in touch. There's no way I'm gonna be able to go through all our legislation today, but um, this one is a really great of legislation written by the ARC and the Mass Hospital Association. Um, so it has their support and um, it's just sorely needed. We know that uh, families and individuals go through uh, really challenging situations when they try to obtain care in a hospital, um, sometimes even traumatic. So we really need to work on reducing uh, those health disparities um, and increasing access for folks um, for health care. And then this year, you may have seen that we're expanding and we're working on a bill that will help us with implementation of Nikki's law, Dana's law. Um, so when these bills pass, they don't just kind of happen. There's this whole piece of implementation that we often stay close to. Um, and because uh, Nikki's law, Dana's law was such an important piece of legislation for the ARC, we are very much involved in the implementation. And there is another bill that is necessary to, um, to, to have Nikki's law smoothly implement without any loopholes. Um, so you see that one on our platform as well as an expansion of Nikki's law to cover day programs. Um, which you know would have been good to have in the first bill, but we were really focused on uh, getting it through and without as, without complication. So this one is just like a covering a gap. And um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of wonderful family support legislation. So bills that really support families, like um, our PCA bill, which will um, require uh, Mass Health pay for queuing and prompting and supervision through a PCA, which currently is not happening. So if you have a loved one who um, doesn't necessarily need physical assistance, but needs some queuing or constant prompting to get through a task, it's just really not fair that they don't count that as a need for a PCA uh, service. So that's a bill that we've had on our platform for a long time. It's just an example of some of the family support bills that we're gonna be pushing this year. So um, you can help by sharing our platform. And like we said, looking for uh, legislation that's personally significant to you and really diving in and getting in touch with, with any of us to for any support. We don't have our fact sheets completed yet, but you'll see those coming up. And uh, we're hoping to do something nice this year, which is a video video summaries, video fact sheets of our bills to make life a little, little bit easier. Um, so I don't think I'm gonna go through the steps of passing a bill um, because we're, we're tight on time. And I wanna leave a few minutes for questions. Um, but what we've been saying all along is the importance of telling your story. So hopefully that, um, that has resonated with everybody and whether you're a provider or a family member or a self-advocate, um, all of it, all of it is impactful. Um, and I also wanted to leave you with, um, with Amanda Gorman, because she's, she's so amazing and inspirational, but also just uh, something I said in the legislative reception that keeps um, coming back to me is these, these uh, legislators do have a really big job, um, you know, to secure funding with all those, with all the competition that's out there, as Charlie said, um, but we have a bigger job our job is to change the world. We advocate on so many levels, school levels, out in our community. We advocate from morning to night. And um, so this is part of what we do. It's not everything. And this is a huge uphill battle, but we just need to stay strong. Um, and we need to look back at all we've already accomplished together um, and know that we will make a difference every day. So. 
thank you very much, everybody, for listening and uh, getting all that kind of crammed in in one hour. I'm going to stop this share, and I'm going to let you know that we will get the slides. Plus, you will get our budget um, fact sheet. You know, if you haven't seen it already, and if you haven't sent it along to your legislator, we'll email it to you. Um, and that includes, you know, all of the line items you can take a look at and, um, you know, so that, you know, we're not neglecting all of the, the other line items and then our build platform. So you can really take a look and dig in. But um, I see like 12 messages in the chat. So I'm thinking there's, there's some questions here. So I'll take a quick peek. Got to scroll way back. Um, let's see. So Melanie, yeah. The t so I, if Melanie, do you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Hi. Hi. Everyone. Nice to see yeah. you guys. Hey, Mel. Um, yeah, I was just mentioning that it's really tough for um, those of us who have children under 16 who have Down syndrome, who were obviously in the phase for vaccination. Um, and my daughter has Down syndrome and comorbidity. She had open heart surgery, congenital heart defect, um, but she's not qualified because she's under 16. And it's so scary because, you know, I think a lot of times people just think that children aren't qualifying for the vaccines, both because they haven't been tested, but also because they have um, uh, milder symptoms, but not our kids. Not at all. I'm totally with you. Uh, like I said, if my son has even a slight virus, we often end up in the hospital. He decompensates so quickly. So um, yeah, the fear is definitely there, whether they're 15, 12. Um, so, you know, I, I do hope that we see that coming out before the fall um, so that when kids go back to school next year, it will feel different. Um, but I really actually don't know where they are on the research. Um, but it is interesting because, you know, we're happy that the governor uh, prioritized sending, you know, opening special education schools and that he really wanted um, special ed to open up as far back as July. Uh, but, you know, the, the interesting piece of that is that uh, we are at higher risk um, for, for catching COVID and for, for negative results of that, even if they are school, school age. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, really a balance there. If you're going to open up the schools and make sure we're back in person, why don't we supplement that with the vaccine as soon as possible? So even the, even 16 and over really haven't had an opportunity um, uh, to be prioritized. So thank you. Um, let's see, the governor's announcement, residents over 60 and workers in certain industries will become eligible in, in the book book appointments. So nothing um, nothing specific to people with disabilities today, I guess. Yeah, General so if there's one qualifying condition that's um, going to open up April 5th as well. So there's, you know, if they have two qualifying medical conditions, yeah. they can get it now. One on comorbidity. So that's where we're, you know, hopefully going to target our advocacy and pivot now towards saying, you know, how about we add IDD as that one medical comorbidity. Um, so you'll probably see a letter coming out about that. All right. Oh, yes, I'll give you the PowerPoints and those additional materials. Yep, that was a, a lot of the questions. Um, Teresa, your question's a little bit wrong, long. Um, do you want to unmute or should I read this? Okay, uh, I can read it. Um, I am someone with a disability and I don't want to sound rude, but this is for all people, not just people with disabilities. We are all waiting for your turn for shots and getting sick with COVID and being hospital alone is not fun. Totally agree. <laughs> Yeah, we're working hard on this. We're not giving up. Okay, thank you for the link to the masslegislature.gov. And we'll put that in the email along with the slides and, and the, the fact sheets. Um, thank you, Danielle, for using the Action Center. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, everybody. Mostly thank yous here. 
rare chromosomal abnormalities. Yes, very, very similar. Thank you, Marin. <laughs> All right, well, I don't want to keep people too much longer, but you know how to reach us. You know how to reach me, Charlie, Ellen, um, Leo, and um, I hope everybody stays safe and continues to you know, have the energy that we need um, to advocate together. And don't forget to wish them a Saint, happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Take care and follow up anytime. Thank you. Thank you for not embarrassing me, Paul. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I, I couldn't do see. enough embarrassing you, Charlie. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> I did have on one of the pictures, that picture of you with the straw hanging out of your mouth, and I meant to zoom in on it, but I, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sticking around, Ellen, and helping. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah, the uh, thank you. federal stuff. It is this pretty is great. Exciting. You guys did great. Yeah, I, really I know. I feel so enthused about that yeah. and just, you know. The SNF comp is amazing. I can't believe we got it increased in the Senate. It's pretty remarkable. I'm really interested to do anything I can to get Nikki's law finalized. And I'm always interested to do anything I can about health training. Really, I'm interested in that all the way. Back I know. Thank yeah. you, Charlie Paul. Um, <laughs> you, you are like my ace in the hole. So I will definitely be going to you uh, for both of those bills. So Leo and I today are meeting with the chair of Ways and Means at 4.30, and uh, we are gonna be telling him only one bill today. We're talking about the budget, but we're gonna be telling him one bill, and that is the bill that will help us implement uh, Nikki's Law without any problem. And then we decided we're going for that. 100%. We're telling him to do it first. And then we're gonna say, but we'll come back to you in a couple months for the next set of bills. So um, yeah, that's what we're hoping. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'm off to teach at Tufts now, yeah. right here. I was going to be here all day. <laughs> all right, see you. And, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yeah, talk to you later. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Bye, tomorrow. everybody. See you. All right.